Hello all, welcome to the solo cast of Firecode Tech. In these episodes, it's just going to be me, your host, Gus Gagliardi. There's going to be a range of topics, but I'm going to talk about specific technologies, installation standards, codes and how they work, as well as some other interesting topics that don't neatly fit inside of the context of a normal interview. Hello all, welcome to episode 46 of Firecode Tech. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the FE and the PE exam and how you can pass your professional certification exam. Want to find out 10 tips for how you can pass professional certification exams and make sure that you make the most of your study time? Tune in. In this episode, we're going to talk all about how to pass the test. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button and follow us on social media so you never miss when an episode comes out. Also, if you could give me a five star on Apple Podcasts, that would be a big favor. My first tip for how to pass your professional certification exam is be very knowledgeable about the test material. Now, this might sound a little empty at first, but what I mean when I say this is be aware of the syllabus for the exam, know the number of questions and the durations. I want you to be a subject matter expert on the layout, the format, and the style of the exam that you're taking. This is going to be extremely important for how you structure what you study, how you study, and what topics are most important to deliver your effort for studying. For example, the FE exam is 110 questions long and you have 6 hours to take the exam. This information is going to tell you how long you have for each question and how complex each each question can be considering that you only have less than 3 minutes to answer each question after you have done all of the tutorial and non-disclosure agreements and accounted for breaks. My second and probably most important tip is to do as many practice problems as you possibly can. The main thing you need to do to pass the test is to answer enough questions correctly. So don't get too wrapped up in theory or in how to understand all of the reference material. Really, the number one priority should be to do as many practice problems as you possibly can so you are extremely comfortable and almost unthinkingly able to answer these questions when you are under a time crunch. I've made the mistake before of trying to read and take really detailed notes over all the theory and equations for the professional engineering exam, and it's just a waste of time because you're not. it's going to be so Uh, time prohibitive to go through all of the reference material and take deliberate notes and you're really not preparing yourself for what the exam is which is uh, question and answer. Tip number three is spend your study hours in correspondence to the amount that they are weighted on the exam. So if you are looking at let's take the fire protection engineering exam for example Fire protection analysis has 17 to 26 questions. However, explosion protection and prevention systems has only 2 to 3 questions. So don't spend all your time trying to understand explosion protection and prevention systems if it's something that you're struggling with and spend way more time on fire protection analysis because you know that by percentage basis, this is going to be a larger portion of the exam. If you have specific strengths that lie in areas of the exam that have a bunch of questions, focus on studying in that region to make sure that you understand the areas that you will have the greatest chance to get the most correct answers. I'm not saying don't study everything, but definitely don't sink a bunch of time into studying a topic with a very low amount of questions that you're really having a hard trouble understanding. Tip number four is take time tests. This might be a good diagnostics for you to take at the very beginning of when you're studying to see which areas you are strong in and which areas you are not so strong in. And don't be uh, perturbed if your score is very low. Some practice tests are much harder than others. And so that is just some tool that you can use to understand where you're at and where you need to focus on for your studies. Also, taking a time test will help you understand your pacing and will get you in the habit of understanding what it feels like to sit down for, uh, you know, eight hours to just crank out practice problems. Tip number five is consider taking a prep course. 
I understand that prep courses can be very expensive, but if you think of it as an investment in yourself and valuing your time for how much time you're going to spend studying for these exam, each time you have to take the exam is another time that you have to spend dozens of hours studying and pay for examination fees. And also there's the opportunity cost of not being able to advance in your career while not having the certification. So it really pays off to just study and pass the exam one time. And so I don't always think that it's necessary to take the most expensive course available. There's a lot of options out there these days. And so take a look around for what you can find for whatever professional certification exam you're looking at and try to think about um, whether it would be good for you to take a prep course. Signing up for a prep course and also signing up for the exam can give you a sense of urgency and immediacy to start studying. I know sometimes I need a kick and I'm a procrastinator by nature, so if you can get yourself to financially invest, it might get you to take it more seriously and start to schedule and study. That's a great segue into my tip number six, which is make a schedule for your studying. Studying is uh, something that I had to figure out after I was out of school and how to make it a routine, how to define it in your schedule, and how to stick to it. Uh, For me, it was easy to carve out specific times um, in my workday. Like at lunch, I would take 20 to 30 minutes to do practice problems every day. And on the weekends, I would take one or two hours in the morning to use my good energy when my brain works best, which is in the morning. You have to make studying a habit because the impulse to study is something that is fleeting and you can't rely on. Tip number seven is understand how to navigate the reference material. For any professional certification exam, it's important to know the layout, composition, and uh, formulas that are in the reference material. Computer-based testing has changed this a little bit for the fire protection engineering exam. It's no longer so critical to be aware of just the entirety of the documents, but you still have to be aware of layout and composition of codes and standards. The quicker you can navigate the reference material, the faster that you can get to your answers. So you need to be aware of all the sections and all the charts in the reference material for the FE and PE exam. For the FE exam uh, from my prep course, after I learned how to use some of the charts in the reference material. Those were some of the easiest questions that I knew how to use the chart. And so I was able to quickly use the reference chart and the small calculation associated with the reference chart. And that was an easy way to get good questions knocked out. Tip number eight is to focus on rest and don't study too hard the day before and the day of the exam. Really the professional certification exams like the FE and the PE are not exams that you can cram for uh, unless you just have a uh, crazy intellect that I don't have. But for me, it was always something that I had to work for, um, you know, a couple months in advance. And then the day before the test, just focus on getting rest, making sure you understand where your testing location is and get in there early so you don't have to worry about any last minute uh, complications to harry you on a time where you are already stressed out. Tip number eight is to create or find a community to study with. Having a study partner or somebody who is also signed up for a professional engineering or certification exam in the same time slot as you is a great way to keep yourself and your community accountable. There are a bunch of different communities you can find. There are some Facebook groups for the PE exam. Also, if you take a prep course, there will usually be a group of people in that group who want to stay in touch and talk about practice problems or things that are confusing. 
This not only helps you in studying, but this can create meaningful and lasting relationships in your career. Tip number 10 is to look up the specific certification requirements for experience, qualifications, and degree so that you can understand when you can get registered for the exam you are looking to take. Um, especially for the PE exam, there are a lot of rules on a state-by-state -state basis for when you can take this exam. A lot of states now have decoupled the experience requirement from the exam. So say a state like Oklahoma says that you need to be six years in your career with a bachelor's degree in engineering and to in order to take your PE exam. Well, since they've decoupled the experience requirement, even if you're only two years in, you can take and pass your PE exam. That way, you're just waiting to get your experience, and then you can apply for your PE license. That's my 10 tips for the PE exam. For bonus content, I'm going to talk about why it's important that you get professionally certified and also some additional resources and information about the FE and PE exam. Being professionally certified is important because it can lead to increased compensation, additional respect and career opportunity, increased ability to participate in new and exciting jobs, and it shows that you carry a base level of competencies expected in your industry related to engineering. There is information from professional societies like the Society for Fire Protection Engineer that shows carrying a PE designation leads to, on average, a 10 to 20 percent uh, salary increase over the career of an engineer. When employers look at resumes, if they have two candidates that are equally qualified, but one has a professional certification that is advantageous to their industry, like a PE license, then the candidate with the PE license automatically has more initial favor from the employer. Professional licenses are how engineering and architecture firms market their qualifications. So there are jobs where basically you cannot even start to bid or be a part of the work if you are not uh, have enough registered engineers with the right qualifications. So it's a way for your firm to display value. NCWS is the licensing organization for the FE and the PE. They release pass rates for the exam on a yearly basis. Sometimes you can gain trends or information about the test from the data that is displayed from this testing organization. I took the FE Other Disciplines Fundamentals of Engineering exam, and you can look up the pass rates for all the different FE exams. As of the date of this recording, the Other Disciplines Engineering exam has a 57% pass rate, which is the lowest of the seven different disciplines that are offered for the FE Engineering Fundamentals of Engineering exam. There is mechanical, environmental, electrical and computer, chemical, industrial and systems, civil and other disciplines. A lot of people take industrial and systems for fire protection and that pass rate is about seven percentage points higher. Although I took other disciplines, um, I know other people have had good luck with industrial and systems because it includes things like ergonomics, which I learned in my degree program, and some of the safety basics. PE exam, since switching from the paper exam to the computer-based exam, has had a remarkable first time taker pass rate increase. Uh, I believe when I took the test, the pass rate percentage was in the high 50s. Um, now, the first time to pass the exam is in the 80% range, which is crazy. It's 82%. And there were 236 people who took the exam for the first time, uh, the last time it was offered. And so, 
it looks like the pass rate for the second time takers is still in the um, low 50s, but I wonder if that will change after this year's computer-based testing round. So speaking of computer-based testing, for the fire protection PE exam, there is a list of NFPA standards that are utilized in the exam. You no longer have to bring these reference materials, but they are used in the, the course of the exam. But it's good to know these documents and which edition that is utilized. It looks like there are 11 NFPA standards. Uh, that seems to be more than when I took the test, although... Uh, now you get them in digital format and you can search them. So it seems like it's a lot easier to navigate this huge volume of codes and standards. That's going to be it for this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed and good luck with your studies for your professional certification exams. It's worth it. Keep pushing and you can do it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to share the episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. Don't forget that fire protection and life safety is serious business. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are by no means a professional consultation or a codes and standards interpretation. Be sure to contact a licensed professional if you are getting involved with fire protection and or life safety. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. (laughs) 